Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. I'm glad to see all of you, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? All right. Well, today I have entitled the message, Manna from Heaven. Manna from Heaven. And before we begin, I'd like to pause for a brief word of prayer, if you would bow your heads with me, please. Our gracious Father, this morning we just thank you so much for choosing to wake us up, for choosing to give us life, for giving us an opportunity to gather together and worship you. And in this place today, I pray that as your word is proclaimed, our faith will be strengthened and we will be drawn closer to you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. So, manna from heaven. And you know that uh, when, you, when I say manna, what story comes into your mind? Pardon me? Okay, the Israelites in the wilderness, that's right. Okay, so I just want to allude to that story and say that, you know, they were in bondage. You remember that that whole thing started way back with Joseph and his, you know, he became second in command in Egypt, then his family came, and then they started to prosper, and eventually, you know, they started being mistreated. Actually, they were starting to exterminate the, uh, the young males, right? And you'll recall that Moses escaped that uh, terror by being put in the basket. So I want to just step up to the time now where we are with Moses. And during the time of Moses, what was life like for the Israelites in Egypt? Pardon me? Miserable. Why was it miserable? Because they were slaves. They were slaves. And they had been now, it, it, you remember that God chose Moses to be used as a deliverer. And after the plagues and all of that, I'm just summarizing and major themes. They were led across the Red Sea, and God stopped Pharaoh's army, and the Israelites were delivered off into the wilderness, right? Okay, so this is where we're going to pick up, because in the wilderness there, I, I, want, I want to think back, and, and how many people went across the Red Sea? Like, was it a couple hundred? How many was it? It, it, was, it was very likely in the area of over a million people, okay, that traversed across the Red Sea. Now, you've got all these people into the wilderness. Now, we're not talking about wilderness like that is rich with foliage and glades and, you know, has lots of fauna and flora around, we're talking about what kind of wilderness? A desert wilderness, arid and barren. Okay, so we've got this throng of people out into the desert, and they've got to eat. They have to eat, and they have to eat how often? Pretty much every day, right? They got to eat every day, and that's a lot of mouths to feed. I think about fellowship dinner here, right? I mean, we're talking about a million mouths to feed. That's a lot of people. So, God had a plan. He had a plan to feed these people, and that plan was manna from heaven. It was manna from heaven. Now, I want you to realize something. I'm going to pick up. In Exodus chapter 16, if you brought your Bible today, could you say amen? All right. We're just going to look at a few verses from Exodus chapter 16, okay? And I'm going to start out actually with verses 2 and 3. If you're at Exodus 16, would you please say amen? All right. Beginning in verse 2 then, it says, Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel did what? They complained, they murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full, 
For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. I want you to realize that this is a group who has just witnessed amazing miracles of God to deliver them out of bondage. And literally across the Red Sea, they have just come. And now they are complaining to the point that they are longing for the flesh pots of Egypt. And I want you to know that when people start to live for the Lord, sometimes when you think about the past, you think of, you romanticize things. And you think about things in a better light than they really were. You have a selective memory. And you only think about those things that were maybe in some way pleasing to you from the past. And listen, there's a reason why this, the stories uh, about this throng of Israelites in, in the wilderness are given as examples for you and I today. Okay, because we have the same characteristics of attitude and we are very prone to complaining and murmuring, right? Okay, having said all of that, they're out there thinking that they're not going to, they're just going to die in the wilderness. All these miracles happen just for God to bring them out in the wilderness and die. And now I want you to consider in verse 15, it says, so when the, Excuse me, verse 14. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance, as fine as frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Now, I'm going to skip over a bunch of stuff. I'm going to summarize it. They were given instructions about how much they could gather and, and when. Okay? That was amounting. An omer for each person was about two quarts of the substance for each person. Okay? And they could gather it each day. But they were only supposed to gather enough for the day. If they gathered more than, like on Monday, they got enough for Monday and Tuesday, what happened to the part that was left for Tuesday? It got stinky and wormy, okay? So, except for when they gathered it on Friday, they could, in fact, they were supposed to get a double portion. And they would eat all that they needed for Friday, and what happened to the portion that was left till Saturday? It was good. It stayed good. So the Lord provided for them for Sabbath, and, and they did this. I, I want you to realize what happened here. They did this every day, Every day, it rained down from heaven to provide for them. And every week uh, on the Sabbath, they would not gather any. They would just eat from the previous days. So they did this every day for how long? Forty years. Forty years every day. 365 times 40. Okay? They did this all the time. Now... I want you to realize something about this, this manna, okay? Um, we, we can understand that it is round, and uh, it looks like coriander seed, and so forth. Uh, but I, I also want to look at the Hebrew meaning, because the Hebrew meaning behind the term manna, do you know what it means? One of the meanings is simply, what is it? That's what it actually means in the Hebrew. What is it? Another meaning in the Hebrew that is also applicable is allotment. It is what God has provided. What is it? And it's what God has provided. It is manna. It is bread from heaven. Now that we've covered all of that, I want to fast forward. I want to fast forward all the way to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Fast forward to John, chapter 6. And when you're there, could you please say amen? All right. Now, before we get into John, chapter 6, I want you to realize something. All of those Israelites, how many were there about? Somewhere around a million, right? 
eating on that manna that God provided every day, except for Sabbath. They didn't gather on Sabbath. But every other day for 40 years. And how many of them actually made it into the promised land out of that original group? Two. Two. Wow. You see, it has an awful lot, an awful lot to do with with faith and something key. What, what is it that kept most of the Israelites out of the promised land? What was it? Unbelief. Right there. Com and that demonstrates their unbelief. They're complaining. They're murmuring. And, and it was like a high treason almost. So let me say this. We know that our generation has parallels with this group that we've just talked about from Exodus. And there's the main thing that we have in common with them are the main things. One is we cannot survive without the Lord's intervention. And two, we tend to have a bad attitude about how things are and we complain. Okay? These are major things that we have in common with this group. Now, we're fast-forwarding to John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, I'm going to give you a little bit of setting, and then we're going to pick up in the middle of the chapter. So let's go here. Check it out. We're going to pick up with the feeding of the 5,000. Actually, it could be called like the feeding of the fifteen or 20,000 because it was 5,000 men besides women and children, right? All right, and that came from what kind of food? Five loaves and two fish, right? And ends up feeding that throng of people. And, and check this out. Not only was everybody there fed, but they gathered up the 12 baskets of fragments. After that whole thing was done and over, Jesus sent his disciples away in the boat, and he went up in the mountain to pray. You remember what happened? Things got rough out on the, on the water, and then later, here comes Jesus walking on the water. And they think there's big trouble, you know? But then they realize it's Jesus. He gets in the boat with them. When he gets in the boat with them, bam, instantly they're on land. This all just happened, right? So now, we're looking, we're going to pick up at the very next day. The very next day after the feeding of the 5,000. Verse 22. Matthew, uh, John 6, verse 22. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except the one that his, which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. This is an interesting comment to me. He, he says, you didn't seek me because you saw the signs, because they have seen signs and miracles, but because they ate the loaves and they were filled. And this makes me think about the fact that God invites us, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's, there's something that Jesus is saying that when, because they ate these loaves, they were compelled to go after him. And when you really will taste and see that God is good, it will be something that gives you a, a drivenness to follow after him as well. But I, I want to move on with what the story is saying here in, in this narrative. Uh, picking back up in verse 27, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. And they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, 
This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Did you catch that, brothers and sisters? They said, what should we do so that we can do the works of God? And he said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. I cannot tell you, I cannot stress enough how big of a role believing in God's provision for you personally plays. Okay, picking up in verse 30. Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Listen, this is driving me crazy. I can't believe they're asking this question. These are the same people that just watched him feed 5,000 15,000 people from five loaves and two fishes. And then they realize that he never got in the boat, but he's over across. And now they're saying, well, what sign will you give us so that we can believe you? It, it seems like such a boneheaded thing to say. But do you know, I want to remind you, we're like them. We are like them, and we're always looking for God to show something more, as if all that he's done has not been enough, to show something more. Now in verse 31, it says, Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. And all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. That's good news, amen? For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of my Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now listen, I want to point something out here. They make a reference, they immediately go to their heritage and the stories and the faith that they've held on to, their religiosity, and they start talking about their fathers who ate the manna in the desert. And Jesus is saying, basically, that's not the true manna. The, you know how, think with me, brothers and sisters, think with me about the sanctuary system. In the sanctuary system, there is a lamb that is provided, right? Right? There's a lamb that's provided, the, the sins are confessed on the head of the lamb, the lamb is sacrificed, and so forth. We know that that lamb was actually an essential part of the service, and that as those services took place on a regular basis, that people were putting their faith in what God would provide, and that they were receiving God's intervention through, actually, those lambs that were being sacrificed by faith. Is that true? Yes. But that lamb was a type. It wasn't the true lamb of God. It represented Jesus. And Jesus, that lamb really, the lamb itself had nothing to do with their, their salvation, their real life. Jesus did, right? It's the same way Jesus is trying to say the same thing about manna. Yes, that manna was used and people were partaking of it. And in faith, they were receiving it and they were living because of it. But this is not the real manna. It's it, just like the lamb. It's a type that points to me. I'm the true manna. People that are really going to receive life aren't going to receive it because they partook of the stuff that was in that jar and omer of manna. They're going to receive because they put their faith in me and they believed in me. Okay, that's what Jesus is trying to say about him being the true manna, the true bread from heaven. Notice this. I want you to notice that Jesus has said twice already in here that he will raise them up at the last day. Jesus' whole focus in this narrative as being the bread of life is that he intends to raise up those who will believe in him. 
at the last day. That's his focus. Okay? Now, <clears throat> picking up in verse 41, it says, The Jews then did what? They murmured. They complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Listen, you remember how we said there's parallels? <laughs> When God provided the manna in the desert, what did the Israelites do? They murmured and they complained. Now Jesus is saying, I'm the true bread from heaven. And what are they doing? They're murmuring. They're complaining. Okay? So in verse 42, it says, And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it that he says, I have come down from heaven? And Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. Again, Jesus' focus is on redeeming us. Amen? It is written in the prophets that they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly. I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. This is making it very, very plain, isn't he? If you believe in me, you have everlasting life. And I am the bread of life. Listen, I want to get to this real quick. And, and I'm trying to go a little bit fast because I realize we've got to get to our ordinances today. But I want you to understand this. It says, he who most assuredly, whoever believes in me will have everlasting life, right? Most assuredly is like the strongest kind of emphasis and promise. Most assuredly. And it says, whoever does what? Believes. But you know that scripture says that even the demons believe and tremble. Right? Right? So this is a different kind of belief. It's not just knowing that Jesus is the Son of God. It's not just knowing that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. It's not just knowing that Jesus is the head of the church. It is knowing that Jesus' provision counts for me. He's not just the Savior of the world. He is my personal Savior. What Jesus did, it is for me personally. And I have no hope outside of him, but in him I have life and life everlasting. That's what Jesus is trying to get across. <clears throat> now, in verse 49... Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And if anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. <laughs> now the quarreled among themselves saying how can this man give us his flesh to eat you realize what's going on man here they are they're in Capernaum they're in the synagogue they're in church it's the day after the whole miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 and now here's the people who just partook of that feast and now they're in church with Jesus and Jesus is making these claims and they're first of all saying how can he say he's come from heaven he's Mary and Joseph's son we know this guy and how can he say that we should eat his flesh and, and drink his what is this he think we're cannibals Right? I mean, they're, they're calling... This must have been some kind of church service, right? All right. Now, I'm going to pick up here um, in verse 53. And then Jesus said to them, again, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Not only am I telling you you've got to do this, but if you don't do this, you cannot live. Right? Verse 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Again, Jesus is always focused on the fact that he is going to redeem you and me. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. For the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. 
So he, feed, he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is not the bread which came down, excuse me, this is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, he who eats this bread will live forever. And these things he said in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. So this was an amazing message. It, it was in the face of people. He's saying, you got to eat my flesh and you got to drink my blood. And it sounds like craziness to them. In fact, let's read on. We're going to finish up this chapter. In verse 60, it says, Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples did what? They complained and murmured about this. He said to them, does this offend you? What then if, I, if, if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits how much? Nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And again, brothers and sisters, this is not any ordinary book that we read from. This is not a story book. It's not a history book. This is a book full of the words of life. It is the only book that is able to make us wise unto salvation. And we would do well to become good students of it. Amen? We must believe what it says in its pages. We must understand that these things in the pages of Scripture apply to you and me. They're not just about Christians. They are apply to our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Reading on. It says, uh, just a moment, verse, what is it, 60, 64, thank you. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. And from that time, check it out, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That was quite a revelation Peter had, amen? And Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? And he spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him. Of the 12. Listen, friends, this is what I really want you to take into this communion service today. Jesus said that He is the bread of life, He is the bread that comes from heaven. Amen. And I want you to realize that He, well, put it this way if you partake of food, you can, the only way you can benefit from food is if you actually eat it. Otherwise, you can, oh, you, I know that's food. I know it provides sustenance and uh, it, it's healthy for you. But if you don't partake of it, it does you no good. You have to eat it for it to nourish and sustain your body, right? And it is the same way with the word of the living God. You must not just know that it is the truth. You must not just know that it is good, that it is powerful. You must actually receive it for yourself. You must own it personally, what God is saying about his provision for you. You can't eat for me. You can only eat for you. Right? It's a very personal faith that we're talking about. It must become part of us. He part of us. We must own what it is that he says about being our provision. We have no life outside of Christ. In him, we have everlasting life. Now listen, today, I want to ask you, do you believe that Jesus is the bread of life? 
Do you believe he is your only means of salvation? Amen. You know, we're going to have a communion service. In the communion service, we will be continuing with this theme of Jesus being the bread of life for us. And before we enter into the communion service, we will be involved in the ordinance of humility, the foot washing service. And I just want to say this about that. The ordinance of foot washing is instituted by Jesus himself. And you know, you know how we want to always make sure that nobody's thinking they're better than us or something. Nobody else does that, just me, right? You know how we, we don't want people to look down us, on us? If, and, and we've talked about this at times. We're in that room, it, it, and they're going to have the Passover meal. And, and now there's everybody gathered. And typically at a feast like this, a servant would wash the feet of the guests. And everybody knew this. And everybody was thinking something like, it ain't going to be me. I'm not going to be the servant in the group. You guys can all think you're better than me. And then, wrap your mind around this. The one who not only is powerful enough to call Lazarus forth from the grave, but the one who actually fashioned Adam with his own hands and breathed the breath of life into him. The one who placed all the stars in the heavens and calls them all by name and set everything into orbit so that it is all in a controlled system. The one who orchestrates everything with om omnipotent power. Stoop down and wash the feet of those rebellious, stiff-necked, ununderstanding disciples. Even Judas Iscariot. Wow. When we engage in the foot washing service, we are mem remembering Christ's condescension, how he humbled himself. And we should humble ourselves too. If we have anything that a, a, against a brother or a sister, today is a great day to make it right. Today is a great day to confess to your brother or sister and pray with them. To wash their feet and let them wash yours. It is a type of a higher cleansing. You know, we ask Jesus for forgiveness. We have to do that quite often, right? But, you know, there was something, remember when Jesus came to Peter and Peter said, no, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part of me. And then Peter was like, well, don't just wash my feet, then wash my head and my hands. You know, wash me all. And Jesus said, he who is bathed doesn't need, you know, to be bathed again. But his feet only. But there's something, it's almost as though it were a mini baptism. Like a total recommittal. And a, and a trusting in God's continuing work of sanctifying us. And preparing us to be in his kingdom. Because remember, that's what his mind is on. I'll raise you up at the last day. It is a fellowship of forgiveness. When we go through a foot washing service, it's just not about getting each other's feet wet. It's about really focusing on what God has done to forgive you and me. Appreciating that. And finally, it is a fellowship with Christ. And believers, when you engage in the foot washing service, friends, you are doing exactly as Jesus did and told us that we should follow his example. And then as a fellowship of believers, we enter into the same practice, 
trusting in his forgiveness and cleansing power. Amen? Let's pray and we'll go to our different places. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much, so much for the amazing provision that you have made for us. And just now, as we're turning our attentions to the foot washing service, I pray, Lord, that you will humble our hearts, that as as we engage in this activity, we will be mindful of your great forgiving and cleansing power, and that we will be servants to one another, considering the other better than ourselves. And I'm asking that you will have your way in this place just now, in Jesus' name.